Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for this presentation of the cattle mutilation um, conspiracy with Nancy, Dr. Nancy Owen Lewis. I'm Melanie McCorder. I'm the development coordinator at Historic <clears throat> Center Foundation, not joining you from our offices today. I'm joining you from my home where I work remotely as well. Historic Santa Fe Foundation is located in Santa Fe, New Mexico on Canyon Road, 545 Canyon Road. The offices, Sala and the Garden are now open Monday through Friday. And our hours are 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And we currently, um, as the governor has mandated, but we're currently requiring masks indoors, but you're also welcome to come enjoy the garden too. You can find out more about us at <clears throat> historicsantafe.org. And we are working on our schedule for salon talks for the rest of the year. We're a member-based organization, um, and many of the salon talks and other events are free for members. They're $10 for the drop-in rate, and we also have an annual garden party and members meeting that's coming up on um, September 23rd in the afternoon after our board meeting. So if you're a member, you are welcome to contact me and potentially join that meeting. We're getting really full for that meeting right now. So we're hosting our artist in residence, Paul Baxendale at the October exhibition in our sala um, in uh, HSFF's El Zaguan. The exhibi exhibitions are usually open for a month and we usually open exhibitions on the first Friday. <coughs> if you wanna find out about our events, you're welcome to go to historicsantafe.org and sign up for our email list there. And of course, if you have any issues, just contact um, me, Melanie, at historicsantafe.org. So you may have noticed if you have not participated in one of our Zoom events before that you're joining without video and audio. We request that you post questions in the chat box and there's also a Q&A. Some people do it in either of those spaces. And I'll read those out to Nancy during the talk. And uh, so we'll try to get as many as possible, all of them if we can. And I'll read them out in the audio, as you may have heard, as just as I was coming in, uh, the video is also being recorded. So please note that too. And we'll put it on our YouTube page. So now I'll tell you a little bit about our speaker. Dr. Nancy Owen Lewis is a scholar in residence at the School for Advanced Research here in Santa Fe. She is an author uh, with um, a history of SAR that's titled A Particular Alchemy, which is co-authored by Kay Hagen uh, and also the award-winning Chasing the Cure in New Mexico, Tuberculosis and the Quest for Health, which was published in 2016 by the Museum of New Mexico Press. She has both of these books to her credit, uh, along with a, probably an extensive list of other papers. She serves on the board of the Historical Society of New Mexico and is the board secretary for um, our very own board, Historic Santa Fe Foundation. She has a doctorate in anthropology from the University of Massachusetts and previously taught anthropology at the University of Alabama in Birmingham and the University of Arkansas. Dr. Nancy Owen Lewis has conducted extensive research on livestock mutilation, <clears throat> in both New Mexico and Arkansas a project funded by the Arkansas Endowment for the Humanities and the First Judicial District Attorney's Office in Santa Fe. She has prepared reports and articles on this topic. Nancy is one of my favorite speakers, as she's heard me gush about her plenty of times before, and we are in for a macabre yet delightful presentation today. So help me welcome, well, quietly, um, my your applause at home, Dr. Nancy Owen Lewis. Thanks for joining us, Nancy. Well, thank you, Melanie. I had originally hoped to do this talk in person because I have a cattle mutilation t-shirt. I have a cattle mutilation cup. Um, so I was, I was prepared for the occasion, but in the interest in safety, I think this is the best way to go. This is a project that has had a profound impact on me. I've collected a lot of data, I've written articles, but I never wrote my proposed book. Um, but it really changed my perceptions about a lot of things. And this topic ultimately brought me to Santa Fe. I was teaching anthropology at the University of Arkansas at the time. And then following the conclusion of the project in 1981, I was hired by the district attorney's office, the same off here in Santa Fe, the same office that sponsored Operation Animal Mutilation. 
and I came on as director of witness security for the prison riot trials. But what I want to share with you is what I discovered during my three-year involvement with this topic. So basically, this is, is my story. During the early 1970s, a disturbing phenomenon spread across rural America, baffling law enforcement and alarming ranchers. Someone was killing and mutilating their cattle. And within the next few years, incidents were reported in more than 15 states, including New Mexico. As the episodes escalated, cattle mutilations received top billing in the press. Stigmata, a mutilation newsletter, was published several times a year to keep readers informed of the latest developments in the mute scene. Articles appeared in national magazines and books were written about the topic. By the end of the decade, thousands of cattle had been allegedly killed and mutilated, but no one had been charged with the crime. As reports accumulated, a pattern emerged that suggested a deliberate act by a skilled perpetrator, referred to as a, quote, classic mutilation, such incidents were characterized by the surgical removal of the animal's eye, sexual organs, rectum, or other parts. Predators were said to avoid the carcass, which was also said to be devoid of blood and slow to decay. There were said to be no signs of a struggle or tracks at the scene, but sightings of strange helicopters and UFOs engendered speculation. Theories abounded from satanic rituals to alien experiments, and many viewed the mutilations as the work of a conspiracy, but there were regional differences in interpretation. I will be examining cattle mutilations in two states that were among the hardest hit by this phenomenon, New Mexico and Arkansas. Ethnographic research involving over 100 interviews with livestock owners and others reveal that the descriptions of the mutilated animals were similar, but the explanations as to why they occurred and the duration of the episodes differed. Set against the backdrop of the Cold War, Profound changes in the rural landscape exacerbated existing tensions. Such was the case when New Mexico reported its first cases in 1975. By 1979, at least 90 livestock mutilations had been investigated. National attention was focused on the small community of Dulce in northern New Mexico, where mysterious tripod-like marks were found near the carcasses of mutilated animals. That these animals had been dropped by some type of aircraft was indicated by the fact that several had bruises thought to be made by straps used to lift the animal off the ground. And the most spectacular case of all was the reported discovery of a 700 pound steer in the branches of an apple tree five feet off the ground. You certainly don't wanna sit under the, that apple tree. Animals owned, all of these animals were owned by longtime rancher Manuel Gomez. Dulce mutilations were often accompanied by sightings of strange orange lights, and an experiment conducted in July 1978 by state police officer Gabe Valdez and Howard Burgess, a retired scientist from Sandia Lab, indicated that cattle des destined for mutilation may have been marked by a substance that glowed under ultraviolet light. 
further evidence of a UFO mutilation link was provided by a test indicating that the chemical composition of the substance was similar to that of a powder deposited on the roof of a pickup truck by a UFO spotted near Taos four days earlier. And then there was the tombstone in a small family cemetery in Dulce, which was said to mysterious, mysteriously glow at night. The family noted Howard Burgess had lost several cattle to mutilations. And in an article titled Close Encounter at the Old Corral, published in True UFOs and Outer Space Quarterly in 1979, he speculated that the stone might have been a navigational marker for UFOs and that had, had been splashed with some substance to enable it to glow in the dark. Evidence for how these animals were subdued was provided by the discovery of chlorpromazine in the carcass of a mutilated bull. Articles appeared in local newspapers suggesting that mutilations might be part of a program of biological experimentation by aliens, the government, or perhaps a joint venture. The 1947 Roswell incident was brought to mind. A link was also made to the 1967 gas buggy experiment conducted by the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission, which detonated an underground nuclear explosion at gas buggy, 25 miles southwest of Dulce to extract natural gas beneath the San Juan Basin. Concerned about radioactive contamination, some postulated that the mutilations were the result of secret testing by the government using black helicopters under the shred under the shroud of night, scooping up cows, excising samples, and returning the cows back to the field. Some traced livestock mutilations back to the highly publicized episode of Snippy, an Appaloosa horse found mysteriously dead and mutilated in her pasture September 9th, 1967 in nearby San Luis Valley, Colorado. Numerous UFO sightings had been reported in the area, which the owners thought had to something to do with the untimely demise of Snippy. A rather belated necropsy found absolutely nothing in the brain or stomach cavity. And after this, hundreds of livestock mutilations would be reported in Colorado, an episode which peaked in 1975. Then in 1979, the mutilation project had, had the mutilation problem had reached critical proportions. And on April 20th, Senator Harrison Schmidt and U.S. Attorney Ari Thompson decided to conduct a nationwide hearing in Albuquerque on the issue. As Senator Schmidt told the audience, quote, in the last five years and probably longer in at least 15 states, animals have been killed and systematically mutilated, mutilated for no apparent purpose by persons unknown. One of the most extraordinary facts of this problem is that the group or groups responsible for the mutilation killings have shown almost unprecedented discipline because there have been no leaks or informants to assist the state and local law enforcement officers in their investigative efforts. Four days later, the district attorney's office in Santa Fe announced it had been awarded a $44,000 grant from the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration to conduct a year-long investigation. Kenneth M. Rommel, 
retired FBI agent was hired to lead the project. And this was at the time when Eloy Martinez uh, was a district attorney. Well, my initial involvement with livestock mutilation with this issue began in 1978. And at this time, I was teaching anthropology at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville when the chief of police at, of nearby Bentonville phoned the anthropology department. Chief Moody, who had recently taken a class in forensic anthropology, needed to help with a problem that was absolutely wreaking havoc. Four cattle and a horse had been discovered dead and mutilated in Benton County, and strange altars had also been discovered. And he asked, could there be a link between this? Well, the biological anthropologist who received this inquiry actually forwarded it to me because I was teaching anthropology of the religion at the time. And so um, I just provided some general information about animal sacrifice. And I mentioned that if it were a sat satanic cult, that May 1st was considered a propitious day for ritual, according to Anton LaVey's Satanic Bible. I mean, these are things that we were talking about in class, modern cults. And I didn't think much about this um, until I saw the headlines a few weeks later uh, in the newspaper, which read, Arkansas anthropologist predicts next cattle mutilations. Two had been found on May 1st. And when I, when I got home from the university later that afternoon, I discovered a, a mobile TV unit had pulled into the driveway. When I got in the house, the New York Times was on the phone. They wanted to interview me. And at this point, I was at the height of my fame and I had never even seen a mutilation. So, I decided it was time to go up to Bentonville and meet with the police chief, at least take a look at the police altars. And I learned that the altars um, were on land which had recently been purchased by a colleague. Um, so he took me out to the site, but my colleague told me that this property had just recently been owned by Sam Walton of Walmart. Um, and so I went and saw a number of these altars, but any expectation of seeing the remains of a cow draped over these rocks would soon be dashed. Because as I learned, the altars were nowhere near any of the sites where the mutilation occurred. In reading the police reports, I learned that drugs had been found in several carcasses, including that of a mutilated horse, suggesting the mutilation was a deliberate act. As in New Mexico, there were also reports of strange aircraft and power failures were reported the night that the mutilations occurred. One rancher would later claim that both his electrical and mechanical clocks had stopped. That animals, that animals were deliberately selected was suggested by the fact that the left eye was removed in females, the right eye in males. The thought that predators could be responsible, and this was all from police reports that I was obtaining, um, that predators could be responsible was discredited with the discovery of rope marks on a mutilated calf, which was discovered within 75 feet of the owner's home. 
and the great skill of the mutilators in doing their work undetected was supported by the case in which a cow was found dead and mutilated in the farmer's barn. Another claim that his dogs, which bark at everything, were unusually quiet the night his cow was mutilated. But another owner claimed that the only thing that was unusual the night his animal died was that the cows were bawling and the dogs were barking. But the otherworldly nature of these mutilations was indicated by a photo of a mutilated steer in Benton County in which a mysterious shaft of light seemed to be emanating from its torso. Then on November 12th, Sheriff Don Reifstrom, who had investigated most of the Bennett County cases, found his own calf dead and mutilated. And the media had an absolute field day. ABC News dispatched a film crew and Channel 4 out of Little Rock produced a documentary which aired that spring. And by the end of the year, 22 mutilations had been reported in Benton County. And by 1979, the problem in Arkansas had spread to 15 other counties. In July 1979, the Arkansas Cattlemen's Association offered a $1,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the person or persons who have been mutilating cattle. And the number of cases multiplied. And even cases that weren't really cases were being reported. One couple I interviewed, a couple by the name of Bonnie and Clyde Roan, had reported two mutilations. And when I asked them to describe what was missing on the animals, they said nothing. And I said, well, why did you report it as a mutilation? He said, well, we think the mutilators have been, been scared off. So we reported it just in case. But what was happening? The fear was intense in these um, areas. And ranchers began arming themselves and patrolling their fields at night. And this really was more concerning in many ways to law enforcement than the mutilation reports um, themselves. I was later um, interviewed by Penthouse Magazine as, this, as the Arkansas cases became known nationally. And um, in the article, Cattle Mutilations, the Truth at Last, um, <laughs> appeared shortly after the centerfold uh, depicting a woman wearing black boots and a whip. But I was impressed by how almost everybody in my anthropology department bought a copy. I thought they must really be interested in my research. Then in summer 1979, I took a class in psychological anthropology at the Fort Bergwin research center near, near Taos. And one of the things we had to do was a research project dealing with people's beliefs. So I decided to do my project on beliefs about cattle mutilations, which would give me an ex excuse to satisfy, to satisfy my curiosity about the cases in New Mexico. So I decided to interview Ken Rommel who was investigating the cases for the district attorney's office. And he had uh, totally refused to talk to the press until a study was done. And he also refused to talk to me uh, because unlike him, I did not have a grant. And I said, if I got a grant, would you share your findings? He said, yes, if you had a federal grant, I would share my findings with you. So I decided to apply for one. But meanwhile, things were heating up in Arkansas. 
On that August, um, B.J. Creedy, a Little Rock lawyer and founding member of the Arkansas Humane Society, invited me to attend a meeting in Little Rock at the governor's office. And the group urged Governor Bill Clinton to appoint a task force to investigate cattle mutilations. And I always wanted to share this information that I was part of Governor Clinton's cattle mutilation task force, but he, he never did that. But two weeks after I attended this session, I applied for a grant from the Arkansas Endowment for the Humanities under the title of Community Problems. Uh, because not only was the mutilation an issue, but with armed ranchers patrolling their fields and the possibility of an innocent person getting killed, um, it had become a, a major concern. Now, my grant wasn't for $44,000, it was 500, but I could get it right away. And the Arkansas Endowment for the Humanities is partially funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities, kind of making it a, a federal type of grant. And I would ultimately receive, receive two grants um, from the Arkansas Endowment for the Humanities. So that Christmas, and my parents uh, lived in Santa Fe when I went home for Christmas, I met with Ken Rommel and I said, I now have a government grant and would you share your findings with me? And he did. And in the process, he told me that he was expected to write up his results in a sizable report. And he asked for my input. And I recommended that he hire an anthropologist who was knowledgeable about the topic. Well, Ken Rommel completed his investigation in spring 1980 and disclosed his results at a two hour press conference. The cattle, he announced, had died of natural causes. Their remains, he continued, had been mutilated by buzzards, coyotes, and other scavengers. If buzzards did that, said one angry rancher, they did it with knives. If surgeons did it, replied Rommel, they did it with their teeth. He then proceeded to document his findings with slides taken of the 15 cases he had personally investigated. Although the animals, quote, classic parts were often missing eye, tongue, anus, reproductive organs, the jagged edges of the wounds, he said, made it obvious that the damage was done by scavengers who had left fur, feathers, fur, or footprints at the scene. He noted that a smooth looking incision didn't mean that the animal was cut with a knife. And he cited cases in which Microscopic analysis subsequently re revealed a consistent lesion of tearing and tooth marks. So without going that further step of doing that type of analysis, he said you couldn't really tell. The press was not pleased. And in an article in Taos Magazine, independent investigator David Perkins described Rommel's findings as, quote, unadulterated bullshit. Rommel documented his findings in a new, in a 297 page report, which he hired me to write. And in his report, which was issued that summer, he explained that the drug bowl had been on medicated feed a likely explanation for the traits of chlorpromazine found in its system. As for the tripod marks and bruises, he noted that no casts were ever taken of those marks, nor was any evidence cited to support the belief that the bruises were made by a strap used to lift and lower the animal from the aircraft. As for the steer found in an apple tree, 
Further investigation revealed that the animal had actually been found at the base of the tree, but there were a few branches broken above and they thought it must have fallen through the tree. He also noted that none of the animals marked for mutilation with this supposed white powder had ever been mutilated. And then he was able to get a sample of the white powder deposited on the pickup truck by a UFO in Taos. And he sent it to the FBI lab and the FBI lab determined that it was white enamel house paint. And as for the glowing tombstone, Ramo concluded that it was reflecting a light from a nearby store and it stopped glowing when he blocked the light. Ramo also examined other incidents, um, including the mysterious case of Snippy, the mutilated horse from nearby San Luis Valley in 1967. And Ramo managed to finally tracked down Dr. Wallace Leary, who was one of the veterinarians who conducted the necropsy on the animal. And Dr. Leary said he found two 22 caliber bullet holes in Snippy's body. And Snippy was also examined by Dr. Robert Adams, a veterinarian from Colorado State University, who said that the animal likely had died from an infection caused by the bullets that after being shot, he perhaps ran himself to death through one of the many broken down barbed wire fences donning the pasture, which would explain his condition. And also the horse wasn't found um, you know, for two days. The horse had been missing for two days. Um, the vets also claimed that bacteria, birds, coyotes were responsible for the absence of organs in the, in the abdominal cavity, but a necropsy wasn't actually performed on the animal until almost a month after, after its demise. So shortly after Rommel issued his report, two quote, last classic mutilations were reported in New Mexico, both of which were investigated by officer Gabe Valdez and the owner of one animal, this is quote, the owner of one animal thinks it's kind of fishy that once Rommel's investigation ended, the mutilations start up again. And this was a report in the Albuquerque Journal. But during the months that followed, the number of cases declined sharply and the panic that once gripped the state had ended. And one reason I wanted to write the report because I, I had access to all of his information, pages and pages of police reports and plus reports from other states. So meanwhile, back in Arkansas, I conducted my own research and I examined cases in about 10 different counties, conducted over 100 formal interviews, including 65 with livestock owners, as well as veterinarians, the media. I actually interviewed one reputed witch. Um, what my study was about, I wanted to know what the people that thought themselves, what the ranchers thought, what, what was their interpretation and what was their relationship with their animals and who were these people and originally I thought you know if they're all if they're thinking this is due to devil worshipers are these people that just moved into this area are they newcomers I found the opposite uh, to be the the case I discovered that almost all the ranchers who reported these incidents were longtime residents of Arkansas many of whose ancestors had settled there in the mid 1800s, bringing with them a fundamental Protestantism. In fact, one man I interviewed um, water witched 
using the Bible. And I actually had an opportunity to try it and I was able to locate his underground well. Many expressed concern about the changes brought about all the newcomers moving into the area. And although the altars were located miles from the nearest mutilation sites, most people seem to blame the mutilations on cults, devil worshipers, or even the devil themselves. And in the same breath, ranchers told me, we never had anything like this happen around here before all those outsiders moved in. You know, and not necessarily blaming them, but it created a, an unstable environment. It was like something they hadn't experienced before. I mean, you had developers coming in, buying up large tracts of land and retirement communities springing up in sleepy villages like Bella Vista. The creation of nearby Beaver Lake destroyed several traditional communities where some of these people said, I was born in a community, it's now under Beaver Lake. And it attracted numerous people to the area and resort communities sprung up around its shores. And as one elderly farmer lamented, we no longer know our neighbors. They come from every state in the United States. They're here today, gone tomorrow. You can't depend on them. I also interviewed <clears throat> folklorist Vance Randolph, author of Ozark Magic and Folklore, who pointed out that strange or disturbing occurrences are still interpreted as witchcraft or works of the devil, which may explain why the cult or the devil worshiper theory remained popular in Arkansas. So I began checking out uh, these beliefs that I had heard. <clears throat> and I interviewed the veterinarians who had performed necropsies, for example. And I discovered that the succinicholine found in a mutilated horse had likely been injected by the owner to subdue the animal because according to the veterinarian, the owner had been in process of castrating the animal when it died, it was a child's pet. And one of the beliefs was the you know, animals were devoid of blood and the veterinarian said, oh no, the animal's full of blood inside. Um, so that was that particular case. There were other drugs discovered Santonin found in a mutilated calf, although a, a wormer no longer in the market was still used and could have been used in this particular case as well. Then there was the belief that the left eye was removed in females and the right in males. It, it, that wasn't true. Um, I kept a catalog of what parts were missing. And it was always the up eye, whether it was male or female. As for the mutilated cow in the farmer's barn, and I interviewed um, all of the ranchers, certainly in Benton County and other number of other counties as well. Um, anyway, the mutilated cow found in the farmer's barn, the problem was the cow had actually never been mutilated. The owner told me that the cow had been sick and he had moved it to the barn where it had died of black leg. And around the same time, he discovered the mutilated carcass of a yearling bull. And for some reason, the investigating officer voted photograph both animals. As for the rope marks on the dead calf, the owner told me that the boy who exercises his horses had discovered the dead calf and dragged it up to the house. And he forgot to tell the owner until several days later, but by that time the sheriff's office had already investigated the incident. And as for the mysterious ray of light emanating from the mutilated 
steer, I actually talked to the police photographer who took the photo and he said, oh, it's just a static spark. It, it doesn't really mean anything. So what was going on? Who were killing <clears throat> and mutilating the cattle? Shortly after I received my first grant, an experiment was conducted in Washington County, um, which is actually where I was living uh, near the university. And on September 4th, 1979, rancher Jack Perry donated a sick calf, which was dying anyway, but they, he, hum he humanely, humanely killed the animal. And then the carcass was monitored by the sheriff's deputy for over 30 hours. They hid in the bush and they, <laughs> I mean, they had reports like at 10.05, uh, we see a bird approach, this time here comes a skunk. But anyway, by the time they completed their vigil, the animal resembled the mutilations they had investigated. So who were the mutilators? There were skunks, buzzards, blowflies, who were seen feeding on the carcass when last photographed. Shortly after the results of this experiment were publicized, no more mutilations were reported to the state police. And reporters told me that mutilations were no longer newsworthy. And I asked the livestock owners themselves what they thought about the explanation, death by natural causes and scavenger damage. Well, prof the professional ranchers that I interviewed, these are ones with the large operations, which they ran as a business, um, accepted this explanation. As the head of the Arkansas Cattlemen's Association admitted, we were just caught up in the hysteria. If there hadn't been anything said about mutilations, we'd have just believed the damn dog killed it. Then in April, 1981, I interviewed Dr. Norman Gray, because I now have expanded to other counties in Arkansas. And he was a veterinarian from Moralton, Arkansas. And he told me that the quote, mysterious cattle deaths he had examined were due to black leg. And he told me of one case where an owner, I guess, was in the process of moving. He had neglected his herd for some time and a number of his animals had died. And it, he said it was a way he could save face by claiming mutilation and perhaps insurance compensation. And when I was doing my interviews before I I, I began, I went to the animal science <clears throat> department at the University of Arkansas to get some tips on types of questions I could ask to gain some kind of in, indication of what type of cattle raising operation uh, the owner had, whether it was professional, whether it was more of an avocation, and they gave me some questions I could ask. And they said, if it's a professional operation, they will have breeding seasons um, for the bull. But if you have a rancher where the bull runs with a herd, you can guarantee that's more of a hobby or more of a part-time avocation. At least that's what they said. And, and that, and, and I did discover that. And so when I asked that question, another question I asked is if they named their animals, if, they, if their cows, if their bull ran with the herd, they generally named their animals. And I'm not saying they abused these animals or mistreated them or mismanagement. It was just a different scale of operation. And if an owner named the animal, I, the mutilated, cow was, that was that Rosie, or it was Bessie's calf. 
they seem to be more likely to believe in mutilations as otherworldly or occult. And as several of them said, we treat our animals like people. And one woman said they're like part of the family. And I didn't get that with like the head of the Cattlemen's Association where they ran hundreds of head of cattle. It was a different operation. And most of these um, owners, you know, were just did cattle part-time. They all, almost all of them had other jobs. And so they had just a few head and there were small spreads of cattle. So I, and I asked people, um, why did the mutilation stop? You know, or, or did they? Well, most people would be afraid to report a mutilation now, said one rancher. They'd be afraid the authorities would laugh at them. But others had a different interpretation. As one elderly man explained, they moved on to other places. It was getting too hot for them here. Although the cattle mutilation panic has long since ended, occasionally the newspaper will print a small report, but it's no longer making the headlines. It's generally no longer front page news. But it has certainly made it into our popular culture, such as this ad that appeared later in Better Homes and Gardens. Upon his retirement, Officer Gabe Valdez, who investigated the Dulce cases and who I interviewed as well as part of my own research, became an investigator for the National Institute for Discovery Science. Valdez died in 2011, and two years later, his son Greg published Dulce Base, The Truth and Evidence <clears throat> from the Case Files of Gabe Valdez. Ken Rommel died the following year in 2012, and his obituary cites, quote, his decisive and controversial official report on cattle mutilations as one of his crowning achievements, two very different points of view. Although cattle mutilations are not reported very often today, a network of independent investigators dissatisfied with Rommel's conclusions continue to search for answers. And as for Arkansas, things are quiet. For as folklorist Vance Randolph predicted back in 1947, instantly the devil vanished in a cloud of stinking smoke. Thank you. Hi, Nancy, that was fantastic. I have like, I've noted a few questions along the way, but <laughs> you might have gotten to every single one of them. So do you still keep up with a lot of the reports? Um, I do, I, I, you know, I go through periods. There was a period when I first um, was hired at SER and I had, I got, I got all my data transcribed. I kept up with it. I went and read about conspiracy theories because I was going to write a book, which I, I didn't, I was working full time, but I do, I, I do keep up with reports when they, uh, the topic interests me, do you but still it certainly never rose to the level it did during the height of these, the phenomena in Arkansas and New Mexico. They're little articles. Yeah. Do you still mm -hmm. consider a book or do you think that's kind of past now? <laughs> uh, yeah. I still have all the interviews. I, I got a lot of stuff. Yeah. Maybe I can give it to someone. <laughs> yeah, I like how you kind of snaked yourself into it. Would, a it, would make a great, it, would, it would make a great topic for sure. The people were so interesting that I talked to. Yeah, 
I think uh, I was saying, I like how you snaked yourself into a job too, where you said, oh, maybe you should have an, and uh, uh, when you are wanting to write Rommel's report for him. So you ended up writing the 200 page report. I did. I wrote that. I've never written so much in my life. I wrote 297 pages in one month. And then after that, the district attorney's office hired me to analyze the data from the prison riot pr prosecution. So uh, I worked into the job, although that wasn't my intention at the time. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, if anyone wants to post any questions in the chat box, uh, there's none of them popping up just yet. Uh, and let me see if I have something else, because then I can take a, a couple minutes of your time if there's something that I want to be nosy about. So do you kind of uh, agree with some of the decisions about, because um, it's interesting that they conducted an experiment with one animal to find out what had happened to, what? how many animals, how many reportings? Of the were, you know, there were 90 reports in New Mexico, more or less, that were investigated in a, about 100 in Arkansas. They were investigated by, you know, reported to the authorities. Yeah, but that thing there was only yeah, one. Yeah, that, that is interesting. That one, that one case really swayed, changed people's opinions. But also the Rama report, even though there was a lot of backlash to it, um, it really died down right after that. There were a few cases reported, but it was kind of over. Yeah, well, you don't hear a lot about, you don't hear quite as much about satanic cults as you did back then, too. <laughs> no, no. And one interesting thing, when I was interviewing, um, <laughs> I was interviewing this Dr. Norman Gray, the veterinarian in Moralton County, who had examined a lot of these mutilated cows. And he said, oh, they just died of black leg. You know, this is, he just, this is just ridiculous. They, I, he just, you know, he, there's nothing mysterious about what happened there. Um, but anyway, when I was talking to him, he, he got a phone call. And he said, I've got to take this, this phone call. It's long distance. But why don't you take a look at this while I'm on the phone, and then I'll get back to you. And he handed me this large plaster cast, of this 18-inch long cast. And anyway, when he came back, he said, what do you think? And I said, I said, is, is this a footprint? Is this Bigfoot? Is, is this a cast of Bigfoot? And he said, yes. He <laughs> said, a friend of mine had been out hunting turkeys and he discovered tracks and he spotted a black hairy creature and he became frightened, ran back to town. He contacted me and I went out to the site, made plaster casts, I took photos and they were published in Alien Animals and then he stopped. He said, oh my gosh. I'm no different than these people reporting cattle mutilations. So. <laughs> well, that kind of it kind of threads in. We did get a couple of questions. It kind of threads into Robin Miller's question here: that is, what insights does this give you about the proliferation of conspiracy theories today? And she's oh also, my goodness, you know this absolutely. This is how conspiracy theory really looked during the Cold War and before. The, the age of the internet. I mean, before the cattle mutilations, you know, became so prominent, there were, there's always been conspiracy theories. And I think maybe the United States kind of is kind of a, is a good place for these to be generated. But going, plowing through the literature, early on, conspiracy was relegated more to the fringe. Then with cattle mutilations, it became more front and center. And cattle mutilations weren't the only thing. Now with the internet and QAnon and all that, they are, we're awash with them and with a lot more consequences absolutely has a, a relevance today. And of course this is a conspiracy, conspiracy theory, you know, kind of centered in rural America and changes that were going on that kind of the anxieties um, that kind of uh, cause people to latch on to the, the mysterious causes of these things that were happening. But yeah, I think it's very much 
a related an early some an earlier example, an example before the internet, an example during the Cold War. So and someone says Sarah Hanlon says if they are the result of scavengers, why did they stop? Well, because the police, if they decided the mutilations were caused by scavengers, um, it, it was no, no, it was no longer news, newsworthy. I mean, you, you know, what causes I, uh, something like this, um, a craze that people are reporting this, this is occurring all over. You've got several factors. Um, one is you have the media carrying stories and two, you have, in this particular case, law enforcement validating that there's something odd. Um, but once these reports came out that kind of detracting from that, that there wasn't really anything odd about it, if the media doesn't think this is newsworthy, as they said in Arkansas, and even the law enforcement said, no, um, this convinces me. It, um, the reports dried up. It's, it's the same thing happened here. I, they might have had a few right afterwards, but there are, aren't very many. You do see occasionally you'll, you'll get you'll get one, but it's you know a small article. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's the answer to the question, but it's you get an, you get authority figures and you get the media, but if those change, then the thing kind of dies if there's no substance to it. Well, that was a fantastic talk, um, Nancy, as always. And um, thank you so much. Uh, and at the one of the first questions too, and I'll mention this right now, is that the talk will be recorded or is being recorded and we'll put it on our YouTube page. Um, so, and we usually put it on historicsantafe.org for a little while too on our homepage and on our blog. So people can watch it again and- um, <laughs> Okay. Sorry. All right. Well, thanks so much, Nancy. And thank okay, you all. You're for welcome. And we'll see you all soon, we hope. All right. All right. Thanks, Nancy. Bye. Bye.